This is NBC News special coverage of the Democratic National Convention. Live from Chicago, here is Tom Yamas. Tonight we are live from Chicago for the final night of the Democratic National Convention. Every speech, performance, and event over the past few days all leading up to this very moment. Vice President Kamala Harris to become the first woman of color accepting the Democratic nomination in a history-making speech. When she steps up to the podium right behind me, it will be the biggest test of her political career thus far. And we're not exaggerating. She has never given a convention speech of this magnitude because four years ago, you'll remember, this was all virtual. But tonight, a much different story, and here's why. Take a live look at the convention stage at this hour. Top Democrats, celebrities, and advocates continue to make their case for a Harris Walls ticket. But tonight, it will be Vice President Harris defining herself, painting a vision of her presidency and what's at stake going up against former President Trump. A moment which wasn't even a reality until just a month ago when Biden bowed out, pushing his VP to the top of the ticket. And as we enter primetime, several big names preparing to take that stage, some of which were considered Harris's running mate on that short list. Take a look right here. This evening, the DNC power, pop singer Pink spotted during a sound check this afternoon, and country trio The Chicks will perform the national anthem. Will there be more surprises in store to cap off this star-studded convention? We're going to have to wait and see and find out. Again, we're going to be dipping in. It'll be a dip in Palooza, as we say, taking the speeches live when, when they warned them. Former cabinet members under President Biden, Marsha Fudge, who served as Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, is speaking right now. Let's take a quick listen. And Urban Development, Marsha Fudge. has fought to protect homeowners and renters her entire career. As Attorney General, she held big banks accountable for their role in the foreclosure crisis and won billions of dollars for California homeowners. As Vice President, she and President Biden helped over 400,000 homeowners at the risk of foreclosure during the pandemic. And as President, she will build three million new homes and rentals, limit unfair rent increases, and offer down payment support for first-time home buyers. It's personal. Kamala remembers her mother's pride at buying their first home after saving for 10 years. She knows housing is a human right and a pathway to the middle class. Where you live determines what schools your children go to, what health care you receive, and whether you can get a good job without spending hours commuting. Where you live too often determines how you live. Donald Trump has no idea how housing works for everyday Americans. He doesn't care. He started his career being sued for denying housing to black families. As president, he sat by while the cost of housing skyrocketed. Now, we can hand the keys to our housing policy back to a negligent landlord, or we can elect a president who believes in safe, affordable housing for all. Let's ensure we have an opportunity economy by voting for Kamala Harris. Thank you. Okay, we've been listening to former HUD secretary there, Marsha Fudge. From here at the Democratic National Convention, joining us now is a very special guest, New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. She spoke at the DNC on the stage last night. And back in 2022, Harris officiated the governor's wedding at the vice president's residence when that happened. Governor Grisham Lujan Grisham, there it is right there. That'd be quite the moment, huh? What was that like, and how did that, how did that come about? Uh, it was the women governors. We were having a dinner strategizing about women 
executives and leadership. And uh, Kate Brown, the go uh, governor of Oregon at the time, said, you know, you better marry Lujan Grisham. She's living in sin, and she's a Catholic, and that won't go well for a re-elect. And I said, I'll do it, but only if all the women governors are bridesmaids. And it happened? And it exactly happened. And she, she officiated. Was she game for it? She was totally game for it. She followed up. Uh, she and Doug were incredibly kind. It was a lovely, very small, very personal with my best buddies, uh, those lady governors uh, in the wedding. It was lovely. All right. We have this great long lens camera just behind us here. It's across the hall. This is one of the first surprises we're going to have tonight, Governor. Okay. So just below us, trivia question. Who's just below us? Do you have any idea? Oh, it's those New Mexicans. Oh, you can wow. You're sharp. That's right. You're, that's why you're governor. You're so oh. sharp. Uh, just below us is your delegation, the delegation of New Mexico here. What do you hope to hear from, from Vice President Harris tonight? Well, I think we are all going to hear uh, much of what we've been hearing, a case for the future, optimism, real hope for the kinds of things that too many Americans, frankly, too many New Mexicans still waiting for, even though there's movement in all the right directions. And making it really clear, she's been doing that work as vice president. She did that work as a senator. She did that work as an AG. She did that work as a DA. Uh, she's battle-tested yeah. and ready. Okay, so the New York Times has a story that's out today. It's on their front page. Let's put it up on the screen for our viewers here. It's titled, What Drives Kamala Harris? The Art of the Possible, it says, right? But it says this. Talking about her first race as attorney general in the state of California, she opposed a measure that would legalize marijuana for recreational use. A week after announcing her presidential bid in 2019, Ms. Harris said she favored legalization and joked about having smoked pot in college. Since becoming the Democratic nominee last month, Ms. Harris has quietly abandoned a number of the more liberal positions from her primary bid, for example, saying she no longer supports banning fracking, a single-payer health care system, mandatory gun buyback programs, or cutting the number of border agents. Republicans are attacking her. They're calling her a shapeshifter, right? That you don't know who she is. She's a political chameleon. Do they have a point? I don't think so. Look, I want someone whose attitudes, policies, ideas uh, move with where the country is. I mean, frankly, they said the same thing about the current president, Joe Biden, about positions. She said that about Joe Biden. We change. We mature. Things are different. I was a huge proponent of uh, medical cannabis. Got it finally into the state, but I was hesitant on recreational cannabis. The more I learned about cannabis, now it's a recreational opportunity in New Mexico. Uh, my uh, involvement and my intellectual ability to understand the impacts of those issues changes. Yeah. You don't want someone who's stuck in yesterday or right. so forward thinking won't take into consideration real life things that are happening right now. You know, it's interesting. She's been in the, on the national stage, I would say, since about 2019, okay? She's been our vice president for the last three, four years, and yet the the head of her campaign, Jen O'Malley Dillon, told Politico, America, the American people really don't know her yet. How is that even possible? And I ask that because even though she's been, I guess, the, the headliner every night, the last two nights she's sort of been kind of missing almost. You know, there's been other speakers. Do you think that's on purpose? And will the American people get to know her? Oh, I, they are definitely going to get to know her. I think it's hard when you're like, if people say in New Mexico, if you, in fact, who's the lieutenant governor in New Mexico? Yeah. That's a tough one. Yeah. Yeah, right back but, at but you. I mean, I mean, listen, but so, I mean, but that, 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 you put me on the spot there. That, that, that's a little no, rough. So I didn't mean to do that yeah, in yeah, that yeah, way. Yeah. I really didn't because I appreciate the question. But you focus on the commander in chief. It's also not the same as the vice president, it, though. It I'm sorry. Not, it's not the same. But in some ways, for everyday Americans, it can be. Who is, is the lieutenant governor? Do you know? Yes, no, it's <laughs> Um, and so I do think it's a valid issue, reintroducing people, being humble, genuine in the moment, telling them who you are so they get a chance to be more directly, personally yeah. knowing you. That's different, and that's what we're doing now. Governor, we're going to pause our conversation. Okay. We're going to dip into the stage right now. Senator Tammy Baldwin, the junior senator from the battleground state of Wisconsin, is speaking. Let's listen in. Okay. Incredible grandparents who stepped in and raised me, David and Doris Green. Everything I know, I learn from them. In every way a child needs, my grandparents were there for me. And as they grew older, it was my privilege to be there for them. So when I work to protect Medicare and Social Security, I do it with a personal knowledge of what those big programs meant in small but deeply meaningful ways to my grandparents. And I know what they mean for your parents 
and grandparents. But let's be clear, that is all at risk today. Donald Trump was asked what he would do about Social Security and Medicare, and he said, and I quote, there's a lot you can do in terms of cutting. Cutting? He's talking about cutting Social Security and Medicare while giving a huge new tax break to billionaires and corporations? Well, Kamala Harris is not going to let that happen. And Tim Walz is not going to let that happen. We are not going to let that happen. You know, they've got it backwards. We Democrats, we honor our elders and ask the wealthiest to pay their fair share. Wisconsin's state motto is forward, and my friends, that's where we're headed. All right, we've just been listening there to Senator Tammy Baldwin. We're going to stay in uh, the moment right here and go back down to the stage. As you just heard there, House Minority Whip Catherine Clark of Massachusetts taking the stage. Let's listen to that. I am a proud mom of three. And when my kids were young, I sat down with my husband to go over our bills. We realized that my entire income went to paying for childcare. We asked ourselves, how on earth will we make this work? So many parents will tell you a similar story. They'll tell you that preschool can cost as much as rent, or that they drive over an hour just to find childcare. They'll tell you that the workers who watch their children have it even worse. When parents have to choose between their kids and their jobs, businesses are hurt too. We shut out talent. We lose the prosperity parents could create. Childcare makes our economy run. And yet, and yet, Donald Trump's Project 2025 will eliminate Head Start, close classrooms, raise the cost of care. And J.D. Vance, J.D. Vance says affordable child care is class war against normal people. You know what normal people want? A president who understands this shouldn't be so damn hard. That's Kamala Harris. She's seen this firsthand. You've all heard Kamala talk about her mother. She was both a brilliant scientist and a devoted mom. She had to fight to make it all work to raise her daughters, to pay the bills, to keep the career she loved. Kamala and Tim know that when everyone can find and afford childcare, our kids and our communities will thrive. Our middle class will grow. So let's put childcare at the top of the agenda. Let's build a future worthy of our children. Let's elect Kamala Harris and Tim Walls. Please welcome. All right, we want to head down to Peter Alexander, who's in the California delegation tonight. Peter, what are you hearing from those delegates excited to hear their former attorney general? They've been excited to hear all sorts of Californians already over the course of this evening. Among those in attendance, our friend Deborah. Let's get right to this conversation. Deborah's from the San Francisco Bay Area, home to potentially the first woman, President Kamala Harris. Just give me a sense of this moment. You're wearing white, I imagine, like many other women. A nod to the suffrage movement, right, which would be the first woman president were she to win. What have you seen tonight that has inspired you? 
What has inspired me is so many women now know they can run for election, they can run for office, and this is a moment in my life that I probably won't see again. So I'm really, really excited. I support Kamala Harris. I think she's brilliant. Have you been to conventions in the past, or is this your first? This is my very first DNC convention, but I've been to California Democratic Party. So you've seen the energy in the party before. Is there something about this that makes it unique? Last night, a delegate said to me, there's something in this room, Peter, that is different. What's different is the energy and the spirituality of this event. We are all coming together as one. That is the ultimate experience. Deborah, I have loved hanging out with you. There was an empty seat here, to be candid, so we just sat down and became quick friends. Her friend Cheryl, as well, who we've been hanging out with as well. I appreciate you guys. Tom and Hallie, over the course of this evening, I mean, if you just open up this room and just take a look around, there is a ton of white tonight. The DNC and some of the other organizing groups urging women and men alike to wear white tonight as part of that effort to, um, to to demonstrate the meaningful nature of the women's suffrage movement and the nod to this moment that could be a historic one, uh, just a matter of, what, 70-plus days away. All right, it's right around the corner. Peter Alexander, we appreciate you. We thank you for all your reporting. Joining us now here is Adrian Elrod. She's a senior advisor and a spokesperson to the Harris Walls campaign. Adrian, thanks so much for being here. Thank you. Real quick, what do you think we can expect from Vice President Harris tonight? Well, you know, first of all, she's been working on her speech for a long time. She's been in a prep for the last few days. Um, and she's really taking this moment seriously. She knows that millions of Americans are going to be watching tonight. And she really wants to make sure that Americans walk away with a couple of things. Number one, one, having a very clear understanding of the way she was raised, how her middle class upbringing, raised by a single mom, uh, you know, who worked, worked really hard to provide for the family, that she truly understands what it's like to be a middle class American. And those are the values that she thinks about every single day when it comes to policy decisions. Secondly, she's also going to make it very clear the contrast with Donald Trump, how dangerous a Project 2020 but 5 agenda is. And she's going to focus on her own agenda and how she wants to take our country forward and not backward. Our viewers may not know this, but she's never given a speech quite like this. Four years ago, the convention was virtual. She's never given a speech before that of this magnitude at That's the convention. Right. Is she nervous at all? You know, I don't think she ner she's nervous. She always rises to, the, rises to the occasion, but she understands, again, how important this moment is uh, because she wants to make sure that the American people, anyone watching, understands what's at stake in this election and that she's going to be the type of president who's going to fight for them. I have a piece of video I want to play for our viewers. This is former President Trump trying to put a label on the vice president. Let's listen. She's a Marxist communist person, and we're not ready for a communist president. But under Comrade Kamala, our military has been abused for radical social experiments. We don't need lectures on the economy from a candidate pushing communist price controls. In her speech yesterday, Kamala went full communist. You heard that. She went full. So in 2020, that label of socialism hurt Democrats in the primaries in some battleground states like Florida. By calling her comrade Kamala, communist Kamala, do you think that's going to stick? Is that going to hurt her in this race? No, I don't think it's going to stick at all. And here's a couple of reasons why. Number one, Americans don't like that divisive rhetoric, especially when it comes to those independent swing voters that will decide this election. They want to see someone who is actually coming out with concrete ideas and concrete ways to drive our country forward, which is exactly what you saw the vice president do in a major speech on the economy last week. You're going to see her lay out more of her vision tonight here in Chicago. Uh, but that's the rhetoric that doesn't turn on, turn on voters. It turns them off. Talk to me about the past. Uh, to 270. I want to put up a map here for our viewers here. Um, this is, I believe, 2016. This is 2020, actually. This is the one we have here. So this is how President Biden won. Um, do you think this map is identical in 2024, or do you think some states change, and which states are you worried about? I mean, look, here's the bottom line. You've been covering campaigns for a long time. The states that are the swing states that will decide this election are really the swing states that have been deciding elections for the past few presidential cycles. The blue wall, Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, is still our best path forward to winning this election. But, of course, we also have the Sun Belt. And we have Georgia and North, North Carolina. They're very much in play. Do you, you know, think we, those are really in play? Very, North Carolina's in play? I know they're in play. Number one, we are making major, major investments in those states. We have hundreds of field offices in our back. 
battleground states. Where she just gave her economic speech in North Carolina, so she wouldn't go there if it wasn't a state that was important to us. And of course, Georgia, that was a state that we were invested in 2020, but it was not a state that we had to win, and we won yeah. it for a number of reasons. So we feel very good about where we are in these states, but we also know that we're going to have to fight hard to earn every single vote and win every single vote, and that's what the vice president is focused on. Finally, do you think the American voters deserve to hear from the vice president in an unscripted manner? And by that, I mean a sit-down interview, a news conference, before that debate comes uh, in, two, in about two weeks? Well, she's made it clear that she's going to do an interview, like that's on an issue. But you also have to keep, keep in mind that she's traveling to all these battleground states. She's speaking directly to voters, you know, drawing in crowds of thousands and thousands and thousands. Millions of people are tuning into this convention this week. So she's definitely making sure that she's getting her message out. All right. Adrian Elrod, we appreciate you. Thank you so much for being here. We're going to go live now down to the floor. Uh, a bit of a party now at the convention as they are in transition before the next speaker. Let's listen for a little bit. Mike Memoli is on the floor for us in the middle of this dance party. Mike, we hope you're not dancing. I, I, I don't know if that's what the viewers want. Maybe it is. Uh, Mike Memoli busted a move. Mike, um, you know so much about the Biden team and the Biden White House. The people have surrounded President Biden for so long. Are they the same team that is now supporting Vice President Harris and her campaign? Well, Tom, it's so interesting. There's a reason I'm coming to you right now from the Delaware delegation, because this is an important, I think, moment for closure for the Democratic Party. As I've been talking to delegates all week and also members of the campaign team, the members of the White House staff, they feel like what we have seen over the course of the last week has really validated the decision that President Biden made. It was a difficult one. It was really one that he had to wrestle with. It was one that put him at odds with his own party for certainly uh, a long period of time, longer than he would have liked. But well, the atmosphere in this room tonight really speaks to a party that has been through quite a lot and is now ready to see this through. The difficult decision required difficult choices. It required a, a difficult process here. But President Biden now tonight watching this from California is going to be doing so with a certain amount of pride. I've also been talking, Tom, all week to delegates who have talked about the range of emotions. There was gratitude and relief on night one. There was that celebratory roll call on night two, the joy we saw last night. The word I keep hearing from most of the delegates I've been talking to tonight is history. There's such a real appreciation for the moment that we're going to see transpire on the stage behind us in just a few hours when Kamala Harris speaks as the Democratic nominee for president, the first woman potentially president, as many in this room would like to see happen. There's also an incredible amount of anticipation. You can imagine you've been hearing it as well as I I have, Tom. There's all sorts of surprises that we understand might be uh, in store here, and everyone has their own theories about what those might be. Mike Memley for us. We were hoping maybe a little kid and play action, maybe a little robot, but no dancing from Mike. Maybe the next time we check in. All right, Mike Memley, we appreciate all your reporting. For more on what to expect from Vice President Harris's big speech tonight, I want to bring in our political pros. We have a terrific panel tonight. We're going to start with Rohini Kasolu, who recently advised Vice President Harris on domestic policy. Dan Pfeiffer, co-host of the Pod Save America podcast and a former senior advisor to President Obama. And Hogan Gidley, former White House principal deputy press secretary during the Trump administration. We thank you all for being here. So, Rohini, I was getting into this a little bit with our last guest. I mean, voters may not know this, but this is actually the biggest speech, we're, we're not exaggerating, that Vice President Harris has ever given, because four years ago it was virtual, and she's actually never given a campaign speech at a, at a convention. It, you think she's nervous? Will she rise to the occasion? Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me. And four years ago, I was with her um, during this COVID era, and, you know, we find ourselves here. You know, what you're going to see tonight is someone talking about the promise of America, what this future is going to mean for the middle class, what is a competing vision to President Trump, a future that she sees as one where the middle class has an opportunity, has an opportunities to thrive and making sure that for their kids and grandkids that there's, that they not just understand what's made her take on these big fights throughout her career, the big banks, big pharma, big oil, but also what got her to this place, you know, with a middle class upbringing. Is that upbringing. interesting though? I know, I know you have to do biography, but it sort of shocks me that even the campaign manager for the Harris-Walsh ticket 
says that the American people don't know her. And she's been the vice president for four years. Is that surprising? Well, these are huge opportunities for America to understand, you know, not just what her accomplishments are, which are many throughout her career as attorney general and district attorney in California, but also, you know, what is her what is her vision for the future? What does it look like for their kids and their grandkids? And then also, you know, as we compare and contrast with President Trump, really, what are what are the plans for the mm -hmm. economy? What are their plans for um, reproductive freedom? And those are all things that you're going to see tonight. Dan, I want to show you something from the New York Times today. This is from an article. It's from a focus group, a uh, voter focus group that Frank Luntz conducted. Here's what they found, the headline, why these 15 young voters aren't rushing to Kamala Harris like their peers. The piece basically reads in part, the participants are wary of Ms. Harris right now. They say she's too far left and that she covered up President Biden's aging issues. And they want to know more about inflation, public safety, the Gaza war. She's losing to Trump on a number of those issues. How does she turn that around in the next 75 days? Well, look, I mean, as for any point out, yeah, she's been vice president. And in the focus groups and polling, I've seen people know her name and they know her job title, but they don't know a lot of her story. And what you also hear is people are thirsting to learn more about her, which tells me as someone who's seen a lot of polling that that means they want to be for her. So she has to tell them tonight. Are you saying also room to grow? Yeah, that's tons of room to grow. Because you look at her favorability rating is right now is higher than Trump's, but there's a large, larger percentage who don't know her, who don't have an opinion on it. So she has room to grow and Trump is stuck. So it's good. these younger voters, these ones who are more cynical about politics, who don't follow the news, they're the hardest to get. They're not going to decide tonight. They're not going to decide after the debate. It's going to be a 70-some day campaign to get them to move. And Kamala can certainly do that. Hogan, I, I know you're probably chomping at the bit to get here on this conversation. I know you probably wish you were in Chicago right now, right next to uh, these fine colleagues of yours. Um, I want to show you the calendar, right? This is this is the next few weeks. Uh, the first Trump-Harris debate is now less than three weeks away on September 10th. Is former President Trump going to prepare for this debate in a serious way since that first debate against Biden was so consequential? And this one likely will be as well. You know, you can argue he's been losing focus since Harris joined this to the top of this ticket, uh, talking about poll numbers, talking about AI, talking about looks. Do you think he takes this more seriously? Uh, absolutely. He understands the gravity of this moment. He also is aware of the fact that he beat Joe Biden so badly in the first debate. It set off a whole bunch of uh, subsequent issues, not to mention the fact getting rid of Joe Biden at the top of the ticket and replace, uh, of, uh, uh, excuse me, replacing him with Kamala Harris. So he understands how important that is. He knows he has to have a big night. He knows he has to outline the differences between the two. And coming off of this convention, typically candidates get a little bump here and there. I I don't know that Kamala will, because after all, she's been given billions of dollars of free, good publicity leading up to it. So I don't know how much more room she has to grow on that. But Donald Trump understands that while people are looking at her and trying to figure out who Kamala Harris is, it's always in politics the goal to define your opponent before they define themselves. And right now, the Trump campaign is working on defining her to the American people, because the more they find out about her, the less they like her. So it's incumbent upon him to keep hammering those issues home between now and the first debate. Dan, you, you, you've helped candidates get elected to the highest office in this country. Have we seen enough of Vice President Harris at this convention, do you think? Enough of that. We've learned enough of have, have we seen enough of her? You know, yeah. I mean, she, she was, I don't want to say overshadowed, but you had the Obamas two nights ago. You had Governor Walls last night. Obviously, you got to hear from him, too. It's just a, it's a fundamental difference between how Kamala Harris is approaching the race and how Donald Trump is. In, she was out in Milwaukee barnstorming on a, on a bus tour this whole week. Donald Trump is sitting with his family and his supporters watching the convention. She's talking to voters. What she is doing is the very typical approach is what Obama did in both of his conventions is you work your way into the convention, you let other people tell the story first, and then you come in on the last night and do it. It's, that makes the most strategic sense by far. We're, we're gonna, we gotta dip in now to this speech, but I'm gonna ask you, Rohini, I'm gonna give you the last word. What's the one thing we're gonna learn about Kamala Harris tonight that we didn't know? I think her upbringing, her values, what led her to this moment. And they've said, as Dan pointed out, they're underdogs in this. They're looking to earn every vote and make sure that Americans know that they see them. Underdogs, but up in a lot of polling. All right, we thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, Senator Bob Casey, the junior senator of Pennsylvania, speaking right now. Let's listen in. $15. The corporations say your prices are up only because their costs are up. They're selling you a lie. It's in the bag with the diapers. Prices are up because these corporations are scheming to drive them up. Most companies are good companies. It's the food conglomerates that sit behind the supermarkets, the faceless wholesalers. They're the ones who are extorting families at the checkout counter. This is greedflation. 
I've been fighting it a long time. So has Kamala Harris. And finally, we're starting to win. When Big Pharma jacked up the cost of insulin, we passed a bill to stop them. Now, for millions of Americans, it's capped at $35 a month. So that's one. I've been fighting to ban price gouging on food. And next year, when she's president, Kamala Harris will sign a bill to do just that. So that's another. And when corporations take advantage of a crisis, like toilet paper during the pandemic, we'll hit them with harsher fines when Kamala Harris is president. Now, Americans don't expect stuff to be free, but we do expect it to be fair. The people I'm talking to, from Allentown to Erie, they don't tolerate being ripped off. Americans are hardworking, honest people. And that's what we've been fighting for. We're fighting for honesty. I'm fighting for it. Kamala Harris is fighting for it. Will you fight for it? All right, let's go out and win this thing. Thank you. All right, we've just been listening to Senator Casey there. Next up, someone who actually ran against Vice President Harris in the primary in 2020, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren, a hero to the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. You can see the crowd already going wild for her. Let's listen in. and she can't be bossed around. Now, I first met Kamala in the aftermath of the 2008 financial crash. The banks had flat out broken laws, cheated people, and stolen homes. Millions of Americans had lost their jobs, their savings, their homes. Now, I was setting up the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Go CFPB! Kamala was protecting families as California's Attorney General. You bet. And Donald was scamming students at Trump University and trying to make money off people losing their homes. Kamala Harris stepped up. She enforced the law, she fought the giant banks, and she delivered billions of dollars of help for families. And that is the difference between a criminal and a prosecutor. I love about Kamala, she gets it. We need to make life more affordable for working people. Yeah. Donald Trump, the felon, has no plans to lower costs for families. He doesn't know how, and basically, he doesn't really care. When did he ever fill up a gas tank or worry about a grocery bill? 
The only bills he worries about are from his criminal defense lawyers. But Kamala, she cares deep down, and she will take on the giant corporations that are squeezing American families. In fact, it's something she's done before. During the California wildfires, she went after the price gougers. During the pandemic, we worked together in the Senate to stop price gouging. And as president, she will lower costs for your family. She'll take on the Wall Street firms that buy up millions of houses and apartments and then jack up the rent. She'll take on drug companies that charge an arm and a leg for prescriptions. She'll take on corporate monopolies that rip off consumers and billionaires who don't pay taxes. And she'll take on right-wing extremists who think they should decide who has access to abortion or IVF, Kamala will protect abortion rights nationwide. Yeah. And there it is. Groceries, gas, housing, health care, taxes, abortion. Trust Donald Trump and J.D. fans to look out for your family? Shoot, I wouldn't let those guys, I wouldn't trust them to move my couch. <laughs> we need Kamala Harris. This election is about your family and your future. I've seen Kamala Harris fight. I've seen her win. And when it comes to our families and our futures, Kamala Harris is someone we can trust. So here it is, with joy in our hearts, let's elect Kamala Harris the next President of the United States. All right, we've just been listening to Massachusetts Senator Senator Elizabeth Warren in what I would say is a surprising tone. Senator Warren, as you may or may not know, can bring the heat, especially on Republicans. She did that when she ran for the presidency in 2020, but a much toned down speech. Um, we're going to dip back into the coverage here. They're doing something a little different at a convention and a moment of levity, if you will. This is the kiss camp, from what I understand. Let's listen in for a little bit and see how this goes. program they said it was going to be a kiss cam but sometimes things uh, they don't go exactly as planned maybe that'll come up in a little bit uh we were hoping to go from the kiss cam to kelly o'donnell she's tied up there on the platform camera kelly we know you wouldn't be kissing any of your fellow colleagues there right next to you um but an interesting scene right and an interesting speech from senator warren just now i'll happily blow a kiss to you and to our viewers tom uh but uh, elizabeth warren did something that surprised me she teared up 
the reception that this delegation gave her, and it's a sign of the respect for her campaign and her influence. And as she talked about the joy of this convention, she also brought a little heat because she was withering in her attacks on Donald Trump. And we will be getting into a bit more of that with some of the lineup that we have. If you feel that beat, it's sort of reverberating through our bodies here, and it's a bit more of the fire. We'll be hearing from Jason Crow, the Democratic congressman from Colorado, who was one of those who rescued, protected, helped his colleagues on January 6th. We'll hear from some of the key state candidates who are running for office, like Alyssa Slotkin in Michigan, and we heard from Bob Casey in Pennsylvania. We'll also hear from Tim Ryan, who ran against J.D. Vance in the state of Ohio, the former congressman, a Democrat, of course, lost to J.D. Vance. And so he knows him well and has the Alpo research book on J.D. Vance from his own campaign to have a sense of this. So we're at that point where we have seen emotions, we have seen storytelling. There's a bit of a party vibe going on now too. And it's going to, again, sort of build to the night with, of course, Kamala Harris having her big moment. But again, reminding these delegates that there is a fight to take back home to their home states, to get people signed up to vote, to get volunteers to turn out. So there are some sharp words about Donald Trump's record, and I expect that will be true with J.D. Vance as well. And they want to try to build this night to a celebration of not only the history of Kamala Harris, but to really go through her accomplishments and the things that they believe will outline her vision to build on what she's done with Joe Biden and her own career and to lay it out uh, for the country. We will, of course, see the Walls family again tonight. We'll see Kamala Harris's family. And so the emotions are kind of going back and forth between a bit of that readiness to get in the ring to the celebration of some of the history and some of the emotion. Tom? All right, Kelly O'Donnell for us. Kelly O, we appreciate it. Let's listen in. Representative Jason Crow from Colorado on stage now. Let's listen. 100 combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan taught me what really, really makes America strong and secure. You see, it's not tough talk. It's not chest thumping. Because in war, talk is cheap. And trust me, I know a couch commando when I see one. Real strength and security come from our people, from our allies. Donald Trump's Project 2025 would abandon our troops, abandon our veterans, our allies, and our principles. In Chapter 4, Trump plans to do Putin's bidding by abandoning Ukraine and walking away from our NATO allies. In Chapters 2 and 3, he plans to fire our national security and military professionals and then replace them with mega loyalists. But I refuse to let Trump's golf buddies decide when and how our friends are sent to war. When we join the military, we raise our right hand and we take the oath. We know that it comes with sacrifice, but we also know that it comes with a promise that America will have our back. Trump will break that promise. In fact, in Chapter 20 of Project 2025, he plans to slash veterans' benefits and then privatize VA health care. As a paratrooper, we learned that the leader of the unit jumps first. And then the others follow. Leaders always go first. But Trump, Trump, he would push your son or daughter out of the plane and then abandon them when they come home. Our troops deserve a commander-in-chief who will always have their back. 
That leader is Kamala Harris. And together, we will make Kamala Harris our next Commander-in-Chief. Okay, we've just been listening to Representative Crow there. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to have much more live tonight from Chicago. As the final night of the DNC gets underway, we have an incredible panel of political pros coming up right after this. Stick around. Welcome back to our special coverage of the Democratic National Convention live from Chicago. We're now just a couple of hours away from Vice President Kamala Harris's big address tonight, accepting her party's nomination for president after a star-studded week here at the United Center. For more on her speech and the path forward for Democrats in 2024, let's bring in our political pros tonight. Jonathan Allen, he's a senior national politics reporter here at NBC News. Chuck Todd, NBC News chief political analyst. And Maria Teresa Kumar, president and CEO of Voto Latino. She also addressed this convention last night. We thank you all for being here. We appreciate it. Uh, Maria Teresa, I'm going to start with you. So last night, I think the Democrats sort of flexed their big tent muscle, right? We heard from people from all walks of life, all ethnicities, all religions. But I got to ask you about Hispanics, mm -hmm. right? Did, did Hispanics not getting the billing that they deserve when Democrats are trying to go after Latino voters? And I know Senator Cortez Masto was there and she, she was in primetime as well. But I was just thinking this as I was watching the night sort of programmed last night. So I think what you're seeing is a, a slow teasing of what the Democratic Party means, and you're seeing diff different individuals. I remember one of the biggest hurdles that they had last time was that they only had celebrity in during the Zoom, uh, the Zoom COVID. DNC, the COVID the one. And you saw Anna Navarro hosting for the majority of the time on Tuesday, and then tonight you saw Alex Padilla, and you're going to see a few other folks that we have to hold close to the vest. So I think they, what they are doing is recognizing that they need a broad coalition. How is the relationship? How would you describe the relationship? Because th there was some tension post-2020 about the relationship relationship with Latino voters in the Democratic Party, where they'd be take, being taken for granted. So, if anything, what we've been able to demonstrate that they've delivered, I think, you know, the biggest the biggest piece that we saw in 2022 when Latinos were saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to vote, it was that. They were not that they were going to vote for Republicans, it's that they just not, were, were not going to vote. We just came out of field at the poll last Friday, and we basically found that if you polled and keep battleground states, 2,000 Latino voters in Arizona, Nevada, Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania, we found that not only is Kamala Harris polling 60% for Latino voters in those two battleground states, but she's taking from Kennedy and for the very first time she's taking from Trump. Under Biden, Trump was basically at 38%. Under Kamala, he's at 29%. And that's before the convention vote. You know, Chuck, she, she mentioned Robert F. Kennedy Jr., and we've almost sort of skipped over a lot of the news. Yeah. How do you think that changes the race if he comes out, makes that big announcement on Friday, and says he's backing Trump? I, I don't think it matters at all. In fact, I think in order to be relevant, we better do something this week. Is, right. It's shrinking. The, the switch of the ticket shrunk him. But, I, but it's also, he didn't run a campaign. June 28th was a huge opportunity for him. Democrats have this debacle. Biden's not there. And where was Kennedy? Was he coming to talk yeah. with you? Was he coming to talk with, with, with other media? This was a real, he had a chance to sort of make his case. And they didn't do it, so it's not a serious campaign. No. And I think we now learn this, and the question, you know, and, and frankly, what's clear is what the, the, uh, the sort of the demoralized Democrats that were sitting in that column, the minute the switch happened, they almost all came over. Ironically now, the question I have is if Kennedy does endorse Trump, is it, how many states is his name still going to be on the ballot? Yeah. And he may actually be hurting Trump That's exactly more right. than he hurts Harris at the end of the day. This is why Trump needs this endorsement. He knows Kennedy, Kennedy voters, if you're forced to pick, yeah. prefer him. That's exactly right. And the question is to me is whether they can get off the ballot. Yeah, yeah and how, how can they maximize that? John, I want to put up the calendar for our viewers. This is what's happening over the next few weeks, right? Uh, we, we finished tonight here in Chicago, and, and then... Look, that, that first debate is right there. It's right around the corner. Do you think the Harris-Waltz team 
try to run the clock out before that debate and do no major interviews, no major news conferences, or do you think that's impossible? Uh, look, I think they're going to try to run the clock out as long as uh, they've got this uh, honeymoon period, as long as the numbers are good for them, as long as there's enthusiasm and excitement in the party. When you talk to Kamala Harris aides and you ask them about substance, you say, what is the platform that she's going to put out? They say, here's this one policy, this two po these two policies she put out, but they're not ready to unveil some big thing. They're not ready to have her tested. They want to try to keep her focused on Trump. They want it to be a referendum on Trump, or maybe a choice between the two candidates, as opposed to what had been a referendum on Joe Biden. And I think they're going to get away with it as long as they can. Kind of like a swimmer, if you go back to the Olympics a couple weeks ago, kind of like one of those swimmers that dives in and stays under the water as long as they possibly can before they surface and sprint. I think that's what they're going to try to do. You know, and this is not anything new. Democrats did this with Secretary Clinton. They did this in large part with President Biden. But look, it worked, right? It worked for President Biden. Um, Maria Theresa, do you think they're going to keep doing this? Some people may say it's strategically, it's really important. Republicans will say she's hiding. I think what we're missing is that the majority of the majority of their media strategy is all at the local level and it's on social media. So she may not be doing major news coverage to the New York Times, but that's not her voter. Her voter is literally reading, going on Facebook, on Instagram, and TikTok, and that's where they're communicating. And so it's making sure that she's not making, I think there's a deep misunderstanding of how you actually mobilize voters at this time. And again, the only people that read the New York Times disproportionately are, yeah, right, are but, literally but, the, do are the donors. But there's network the donors news, are with her. there's cable news, there's New York Times. I mean, Chuck, at some point, yes, social media, that's yeah. great, but you, you need more than that. Well, I'll tell you, Bill Clinton in 92 never put out major economic yeah. proposals. Do you know when he did it? The week after his election. Yeah. And he actually had this, I remember, he had this summit in Little Rock. And like, okay, and, and literally had his economic team and they had the very public display of this. My point is, is that look, Mar Mario Cuomo made this phrase famous, which is you campaign in poetry right. and you govern in prose. Now, there's a difference. A, you talked about hiding. If she's just doing scripted events, and isn't taking local questions and isn't doing a TikTok interview. If she's out there every day looking like she's engaging with voters, I don't know if voters will care. Yeah. But if she's not doing that, then it could take traction. Look, she benefits from the fact that Trump doesn't have substance either. Right. Yeah. If Trump were beating, you know, white paper after white paper after white paper, it would put real pressure on her. But Trump's lack of, of substance weirdly helps, especially now with Project 2020. Yeah. No, 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 no. Pay no attention to it. Jonathan, remind our voters, what happened to, to then-Senator Kamala Harris during the primary? People said she was great at asking questions. She had a tough time answering questions, especially during debates. I mean, she had great crowd sizes, but eventually that donor money, it, it, it ran dry. First, it's hard to run for president. Yeah. She'd been attorney general. She'd been senator for like four years. She gets out, has a launch uh, event that everybody looked at. It's spectacular, great energy, huge crowd. And then there was no follow-up. There was no follow-through. This is not, it is not easy to run for president in the United States. The advantage she has now is she's been vice president for almost four years. She's been out making speeches. She's been out meeting people. She's been out talking about policy. She is clearly a more developed candidate today than she was in 2019. Now, I do think there's a question because she hasn't been tested. If she's tested, then she will be in debates for sure. You know, what does that look like? What Chuck was talking about scripted moments versus unscripted. And I also think at some point she's going to have to make a why me argument to the American public. Uh, most presidential candidates are able to explain why they should be president other than being elevated, um, you know, other than yeah. the political reason. Uh, and I think she'll probably have to do that a little more than she has. Marie, Teresa, get the last word yeah, in. No, but I do think she actually has a position on policy. She actually is right now tied to Biden when it comes to the IRA, when it comes to the CHIP attack. And she can demonstrate that she was the one that broke the tie, and she can own all of that policy. Says, this is where we started. Vote for me, and we can finish the job. All right, Maria Teresa Kumar, Jonathan Allen, Chuck Todd, we thank you so much. We're going to go dip now down to the stage the Reverend Al Sharpton now addressing the convention hall. We report where candidates stand on criminal justice, economic empowerment, health equity, and other issues. On one side of this race is Donald Trump, a fellow New Yorker I've known for 40 years. Only once, once in that time, did he take a position on racial issues. He spent a small fortune on full-page ads calling for the execution of five innocent young teenagers. Well, I'm going to bring them out in a minute, but and you'll hear from them tonight. 
because they were not executed, they're here to continue to fight. But it was there that I saw Trump love to fan racial fame, flames. On the other side is a woman that I've walked with in Selma, Alabama to commemorate the 59th anniversary of Bloody Sunday. <laughs> Kamala Harris spoke to me that day about unity and passing bills. All I ever heard from Donald Trump was how he can get an advantage. I see one candidate who wants to protect the right to vote while the other has tried to cook up 11,000 votes in Georgia. I see a candidate who, with Joe Biden, brought leaders to the White House to confront violent hatred, running against a man who said neo-Nazis in Charlottesville were fine people. I see a candidate who has sought to reform and uphold the law, and a man who wrongly assumes his mugshot appeals to black Americans. I work with Kamala Harris in every job she's had. She has consistently committed to making government work for those of us who've been disadvantaged. All Donald Trump has been consistent about is making himself richer and sowing division to get that done. This man sat right here in Chicago a few weeks ago, refusing to apologize for claims that migrants were taking black jobs. Well, in November, we're going to show him when blacks do their job. And we are going to join with whites and browns and Asians, and we're going to do a job on those that have done a job on us. Tonight, we are going to realize Shirley Chisholm's dream. Fifty-two years ago, I was one of the youth directors in her campaign for president. And 52 years after she was told to sit down, I know she's watching us tonight as a black woman stands up to accept the nomination for president of the United States. We have fought too hard for women to be told to get out of the kitchen. We are now on our way to the Oval Office. We won't go back. We fought hard. We fought hard for LGBTQ loved ones to get out of the closet. We won't go back. for the right to choose, the right to education. We suffered and died and bled, went to jail to get the right to vote. We won't go back. Supreme Court tries to roll back on civil rights, no matter what the amount of money they have, we are here because others fought and
and suffered for us, and we vowed tonight we won't go back. to fulfill the promise of a just and fair nation. And let me say, as we transition, I'm a preacher. And in Psalms, it says, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. We've endured January 6th. We've endured conspiracy theories. We've endured lies and areas of darkness. But if we stay together, black, white, Latina, Asian, Indian American, if we stay together, joy, 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 joy coming in the morning. I want to now, since I was a teenager, I was mentored by Reverend Jesse Jackson, and Reverend Jackson taught us to fight for what's right. And now I want to bring out some young men that I fought for. I referred to them then, they were known as the Central Park Five. Now they are the Exonerated Five. Raymond, Raymond Santana, Kevin Richardson, Yusef Salam, Corey Weiss, the exonerated fact. Good evening, people. My name is Corey Wise. 35 years ago, my friends and I were in, in prison for a crime we did not commit. Our youth was stolen from us. Every day, as we walked into court, courtroom, people screamed at us, threatened us because of Donald Trump. He spent $85,000 on a full page ad in the, in the New York Times calling for our execution. We, ooh, we were innocent kids, but we, but, we all, but we served a total of 41 years in prison. Reverend Al Sharpton stood with us. Now, I'm proud to stand with him today. <laughs> Vice President Kamala Harris has also worked to make things fairer. I know she will do the same as president. Now, prove that message. I love these guys. These are my brothers. These are my brothers. Yes, indeed. America. I am Yusuf Salam. A New York City councilman representing my hometown of Harlem. That's right. representing my hometown of Harlem, USA. And listen, as my friend Corey Wise just said, 45 
wanted us unalive. He wanted us dead. Today, we are exonerated because the actual perpetrator confessed and DNA proved it. That guy says he still stands by the original guilty verdict. He dismisses the scientific evidence rather than admit he was wrong. He has never changed and he never will. That man thinks that hate is the animating force in America. It is not. We have the constitutional right to vote. In fact, it is a human right. So let us use it. I want you to walk with us. I want you to march with us. I want you to vote with us. And together, and let me tell you, this is going to be so beautiful. And together, on November 5th, we will usher in Kamala Harris and Tim Walls into the White House. So I want to do this. When I say when they, I want you to say see us. When they, see us. when they, see us. when they see us, America will finally say goodbye to that hateful man. We will say what I have said after seven long years of wrongful incarceration. Free at last. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God Almighty, we are free at last. God bless you, and God bless the United States of America. We've just been listening to the Reverend Al Sharpton and the exonerated five at one point in their lives known as the Central Park Five. Our coverage is going to keep going right now. We're going to pick it up right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.